Good day students, welcome to mathgotserve.com. In this clip, we're going to be going over problems 16 to 20 of the January 2018 Algebra 2 Regents exam. All right, let's take a look at question 16. It reads, what is the equation of the directrix for the parabola negative eight times the quantity y minus three equals quantity x plus four squared? All right, so let's go ahead and write down the formula to help us to calculate or determine what the uh, equation of the directrix is, okay? All right, so formula for a direct, directrix equation. All right, so the direct the equation of your directrix depends on two main things. First of all, the orientation of your parabola is it left, right, up, down. If it's left, right, or up, down, is it open to the left or does it open to the right? The bottom line is that the um, line of the directrix basically lies on the opposite end of the um, parabola. So if you're measuring from the vertex, the distance from the vertex to the um, focus will be equ equidistant to the distance from the vertex to the uh, directrix, all right? So in this particular problem, we have y is not squared. Remember, your parabola always um, curves in the direction of the variable that is not squared. So since y is not squared, it's gonna be an up and down opening parabola this negative sign will cause it to open down, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and write down the formula first. So in this particular case, we have negative four P. This P represents the distance from the vertex to the directrix and focus, all right? Times the quantity Y minus K in this case equals quantity X minus H square. Okay, so with this type of configuration, let me show you what the graph looks like. Okay, so we have, this my, that's my uh, y-axis and that's my x-axis. And we have the vertex somewhere, let's say this is hk. Because of the area, uh, configuration of this equation, it's going to be opening downwards. It's like a sad parabola opening downwards. Now you have your focus in it, in there, and then your directrix will be the same distance in the opposite direction. This length right here is P, okay? This horizontal line is basically the uh, directrix. This is the directrix right here. So what we're trying to do is look for the equation of this horizontal line right here. So it's going to be Y equals something. Okay, so the uh, easy way to figure it out, you just start from your vertex. The vertex is HK, okay? And then all you care about is the K component, the Y component. So you just add P to the K coordinate value and that will give you the answer. So Y is basically going to be uh, K, the Y coordinate of your vertex plus P, okay? which you get from the equation. So that's basically the equation of the vertex when you have a parabola that's opening downwards. All right, let me write it again, y equals k plus p. All right, so let's write down the equation here. So the directrix is going to be y equals k plus p. So all we need to do is extract K and P from this equation and we are good to go. All right, so let's write the equation, negative eight times Y minus three equals X plus four quantity square. Um, so we need to express eight as a multiple of four. So four times two is eight, right? So we're gonna have negative four times two times the quantity y minus three equals x plus four quantity, squ quantity square. All right, so let me put down the, uh, the 
equation underneath here so we can easily extract our k and p values, okay? So we have negative 4p times y minus k equals x minus h quantity square. So can you see what k and p are? k is 3, all right, the number next to the y. You just take the opposite of that. And then our p value is 2. All right, 8 divided by 4, you get 2. So our directrix, we stated what it is earlier. Directrix is y equals k plus p. So that's going to be y equals 3 plus 2. And that tells us that our directrix equation is y equals 5. Answer to question number 16 is option number 1. All right, let's take a look at question 17. It reads, the function below models the average price of gas in a small town since January 1st. So we have this G of T function here between 0 and 10. Question, if G of T is the average price of gas in dollars and T represents the number of months since January 1st, the absolute maximum G of T reaches over the given domain is about. So we're trying to find the maximum of this uh, function in this domain right here. There are two ways you can do this. We're going to be using our calculators to do this. Um, you can either do this using the graphing window or you can use the F max function in your calculator. Okay. All right, we're got, I'm going to go over two, the two ways for finding the maximum, also the minimum, of functions um, using your graphing calculator. This particular problem is a maximum problem, so that's what we're going to do, but the same procedure can be applied in determining the minimum. All right, so just go to your Y window. And what we're going to do first is we're going to enter this equation negative point zero zero four nine raised to the x raised to the fourth power plus point zero nine two three x raised to the third power minus point five six x raised to the second power plus 1.166 x plus 3.32. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, sh go over the procedure graphically first. This one is a little bit longer. Um, doing it using the fmax function is much efficient and quicker. Okay, but I'll show you both methods. Okay, so um, the nice thing about this particular problem is that the maximum is visible. In certain cases, the maximum might not be visible in your graphing window. Okay, so you got to be careful with that. So when you're using the graphing function to calculate a maximum or minimum, you have to be careful to ensure that you are covering the entire domain. Alrighty, so let me just show you something real quick. X equals 10 is right there. So we're going from 0 to 10. The entire domain is captured in this window, so we don't have a problem. All right, so let's go ahead and find a maximum. Now, when you're looking for a maximum, you need to have a, a visual idea as to where it's located, okay? So this looks like a maximum, but the other maximum right here seems to be bigger. All right, so we have two maximas, which is bigger? That is the absolute, okay? So this one looks to be looks like it's going to be bigger. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate what this is. So all you do is you go to the calculate window and then you scroll down to option five, no, option four, which is maximum. All right, so second function, trace, that gives you access to the calculate feature. You go down to maximum. Now the calculator wants you to tell it where, uh, what maximum you want to compute the value of. So it's going to ask you, Pick a point to the left of the maximum point you're trying to calculate. So I'll move my cursor a little bit to the left to create the left boundary. Enter. Arrow points to the right, so the maximum to the right of this arrow is the one that um, the 
value will be calculated for. Okay, but we also need the right boundary just in case you have multiple maximas like this. So the right boundary, just move your cursor to the right of the maxima that you're trying to calculate the value of anywhere to the right, as long as it's not to the right of the second one or else you have problems. Press enter and then it's going to ask you to guess. So I'm going to move the guess value somewhere somewhere close to the maximum I, I want to compute. So I'm basically directing the calculator to exactly where I wanted to calculate the maximum for. Press enter and we get all right, so we see the maximum is 4.22 decimal places, 4.01 at 1.6, uh, 1.61. Okay, so let's write that down. We have um, a maximum of 4.01 at 1.6. One. Okay, so you just have to remember that the maximum is where um, is a y coordinate. Okay, the x coordinate represents the t value, the time when the function attains that maximum. Okay, so as indicated earlier, there appears to be two maxima in this problem. Okay, based on how this graph looks, you might not be able to tell exactly which one is higher. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go ahead and compute the maximum here, somewhere in this region right here. And then we can compare them and see which one is bigger because we're looking for the absolute maximum. Alrighty. Okay. So don't be in a haste to select option three because we're not sure yet. So we're going to repeat the same procedure. We want to look for the value of the second maxima. So we go to second function calculate option four is maximum left bound pick a point to the left of the second maxima so that one press enter right bound move your cursor to a point to the right of the second maxima uh, enter okay so we want to calculate the value let's move our cursor towards the desired maximum and press enter and we have 7.73 at 3.92. So we have another G max of 7.73 um, at 3.92. Okay, so this represents dollars and this represents months. So, ladies and gentlemen, which is the absolute maximum? The absolute maximum is the greatest of all of them. Okay, so your absolute maximum, the absolute maximum of G of T is seven dollars and seventy three cents because that's the bigger of the two and it happens in three point nine two months. Okay, so that's how to graphically find maxima and also how to uh, find the absolute extreme or the absolute maximum. Now let's go ahead and use a second approach which involves using the fmax function. Now the um, benefit of using the fmax function is that you do not get tricked into um, selecting the wrong one. For example looking at this graph right here you might think that they are the same because of the pixelation of the, of the graphs. So it's easy to um, get the answer incorrect just by looking at the graph but when you use the fmax function you can't deceive the program that calculates the maximum it gives you the exact absolute maximum okay so we already have the y the function stored in y1 so what we're gonna do is go home and we're going to go to the catalog um, and look for fmax okay so go to F, scroll down to F and look for F max. What this function does is it returns the maximum of a function over a specified domain. Okay, so let's go ahead and write down the syntax real quick. <coughs> syntax for using the F max function of the um, 
graphing calculator, your Texas instrument cal graphing calculator. So this is how you do it. You call up Fmax from the catalog, parenthesis. Now you enter the expression. Okay. I already have the expression stored in Y1 on my calculator, so I'm just going to call up Y1. If you don't have it stored, you can just enter it right into the parenthesis, into the argument of the Fmax function. So you enter the expression, you specify the variable. Okay, we're going to use an X. And then you specify the boundaries, lower bound and upper bound. And it doesn't ma matter how many uh, maximas you have in there, this function will return just the greatest one. Okay? Alright, so in this particular problem, we're going to be entering Fmax of y1 because we have the expression already stored in y1. Our variable is x. If you notice, when we're entering the function into the uh, calculator, we were using x as our variable. The lower bound, we're going from 0, so lower bound is 0, our upper bound is 10. Alright, so we just enter this into the calculator like that, and then uh, we will get the maximum, the absolute maximum. Alright, so first question, where on earth is y1 located? y1 is a variable, so if you look onto the fourth column in your calculator buttons, you're going to see VARS right there underneath the um, for the directional buttons. VARS represent variables. Alright, so press variables. Um, we're going to go to scroll to the right to Y variables and then select option one function and then that's your variables right there. Alright, let's go over it again. So I want to insert Y1 here. I press variables button and then I go to scroll to the right to Y variables and then I select option one, press enter and then I select option one again, enter and the Y1 is populated into the expression field for my Fmax function. Okay, comma variable is X, lower bound is zero, upper bound is 10, press enter does a little calculation and returns the absolute maximum, which is 7.73. So we see that uh, the answer is in fact option number four. All right, let's take a look at question 18. It reads, written in simplest form, the expression c squared minus d squared over d squared plus cd minus 2c squared, where c is not equal to d, is equivalent to. So we have this um, rational expression right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate the factorization process so our work is organized and easy to follow. All right, so what we're going to do first is extract the numerator. Let's start with the numerator. So the numerator is uh, c squared minus d squared. So we're going to factor this completely and insert it back into the expression. So c squared minus d squared, if you notice what you have here, you have two squares and you have an operation which is different. So you're going to use the difference of squares formula. Okay. So do you remember the difference of squares formula? I call it the dose formula. Difference of squares. How do you factor a difference of squares? If you have a squared minus b squared, uh, all you do is you root the first and the last and express them as a sum and difference. You have a plus b times a minus b. That's the difference of squares uh, factorization formula. We're going to apply that procedure here. Just simply take the square root of c square and d square and express the roots as a sum and a difference. So the factorization is going to be c plus d times c minus d. That's the factorization of the numerator. So we have c plus d times c minus d. And then we'll divide that by the factorization of the denominator. So let's extract the denominator to the side. 
and then we're going to factor it completely. Alrighty, so we have d squared plus cd minus 2c squared. We're going to factor this using the x game. Basically the approach for factoring quadratics, but this is a strange looking type of expression, but the highest degree is 2, so we can apply the x game here. AC goes on the top, AC is d squared times 2c squared times negative 2c squared, so you can write that as negative 2c squared d squared. Okay, so remember AC goes on top, B the middle term goes on the bottom, the middle term is CD. So you ask yourself what two uh, terms multiply to yield the top and add to give you the bottom? That's the question. So let's try CD and 2CD. In order for the uh, sum to be positive um, and it's smaller than the bigger, we have to subtract, right? So since the sign is positive, we have to negate the smaller of the two. Let's check real quick. Negative CD times 2CD is negative 2C squared D squared, excellent. And then negative CD plus 2CD is CD. So that's exactly what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the middle term CD with these two values right here. So we're going to have um, D squared. Now instead of CD, we're going to replace it with uh, negative CD plus 2CD um, minus 2C squared. These two middle terms were derived from our x game right here. We're now going to partition our expression down the center and then we're going to proceed to factor by grouping. From the first two you can take out D and you're left with D minus C and then from the last two you can take out 2C positive 2C and you're left with D minus C. Okay. Now our factorization is looking good because these two quantities in the parentheses are identical. So DC and DC are identical. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor it out. And then D plus 2C are left and they are going to be grouped in their own parentheses D plus 2C. Okay, so let's uh, reinsert it here. We're going to have D minus C times uh, D plus 2C. Okay. All right. Is there any, can we reduce? That's the question. Can we reduce? You notice we have C minus D and D minus C here. They are in reverse order. So can I reverse the order of a difference? Can I rewrite this as C plus D times C minus D over C, C minus D times D plus 2C. In essence, the question is, does subtraction commute? The answer is no. Okay? You cannot just reverse the order of the difference. Subtraction commutes with its opposite. So anytime you reverse the order of a difference, guess what? You have to insert a minus sign there. Okay, so don't just reverse order of differences because subtraction does not commute. Only uh, multiplication and addition that commute. All right, so keep that in mind. Now uh, we can di now divide out C minus D since they are identical, and that's going to yield C plus D over. We have a parenthesis here, D plus two C. Now what we're going to do is we're going to distribute that minus, uh, let's see, we could distribute it to the bottom or we could distribute it to the top. If you look at the options we have here, all the denominators are D plus 2C, so we can distribute the minus to the numerator, okay? That minus can be distributed anywhere, so let's move it upstairs. When we distribute it to the top, we're going to end up with negative C minus D divided by D plus 2C. That's the final answer. Option number three. 
is the answer to question number 18. All right, question 19 reads, if p of x equals 2x to the third minus 3x plus 5, what is the remainder of p of x divided by x minus 5? So for this one, we're going to be using something called the remainder theorem, okay? You don't have to carry out long division or synthetic division for um, this particular problem since all we're looking for is the remainder um, after dividing the um, dividend by the divisor. Okay, so the remainder theorem is as follows. If a polynomial P of X, um, if this dividend is divided by the divisor x minus r, the remainder is simply what you get when you evaluate the dividend polynomial function at the root of the divisor, okay? So the remainder is p of r, okay? So in this particular problem, let's start with the um, divisor. The divisor polynomial is x minus 5, so x minus r is equal to x minus 5. So what is r going to be? You can clearly see that r is 5, okay? Another way you can do this is you just take x minus 5 and find the zero of it. And you have uh, this value is the value you're going to be plugging in, okay? All right, so this our value, we're going to be plugging it into the original polynomial. So we're evaluating the polynomial at x equals 5, okay? So we're going to have 2 times 5 cubed minus 3 times 5 plus 5. If you work that out, 5 to the third is 125. You double that, you get 250 minus 15 plus 5. And then uh, combine these two, you get negative 10. Negative 10 plus 250 is 240. Your answer is option number 4. Okay, let's take a look at question 20. It reads, the results of, stimula of simulating tossing a coin 10 times, recording the number of heads, and repeating this 50 times are shown in the graph below. Based on the results of the simulation, which statement is false? Okay, so let's, we're going to walk through this one by one, okay? Uh, first one, five heads occur most often, which is consistent with the theoretical probability of obtaining heads. So what is the probability of obtaining heads when you toss a coin? Probability of getting a head is basically number of heads divided by number of sites that you have on the coin, right? So number of heads divided by total number of sides. This is theoretical probability. How many heads do you have? You just have one head, right? And you have two sides, head or tail, so one over two. So when you're tossing a coin, coin 10 times and you have a scenario where f you get five heads, you know, um, per toss session, that makes sense because when you have 5 over 10, what does that reduce to? 5 over 10 reduces to 1 over 2, which is basically what the theoretical probability states, which is that you have a 50-50 chance of getting 5 heads when you toss um, a coin 10 times, okay? So this makes perfect sense, it's consistent with um, the theoretical probability um, idea. All right, so number one is good. Number two uh, says eight heads is unusual as it falls outside the middle 95% of the data. Okay, so let's say you have the data and we want to look at, first of all, the middle 95%. Okay, so the middle 95% represents how much and the question is does 8 fall in there or not so the middle 95% is equal to let's calculate that with a calculator there are a total of 50 
So 50 times 0 0.25, 50 times 0.95, so that's 95 percent. You have 47.5. So the middle um, is in the middle 95 percent. You have 47.5 in the middle. Okay. So what you have left is the top and the bottom. All right, so you have 100% represents everything. When you take out the middle 95%, you're left with 5%, right? And then this 5% should be split between the top and the bottom. So if you divide this by 2, that's going to be 2.5%, okay? So, so what we have is we have the middle 95%, which is um, 47.5, and then we have the top 2.5 and the bottom 2.5. Everything together adds up to 100, okay? Let me just replicate this other rectangle I have here. Oh, let me put it down here, okay. All right, so this is top 2.5% and then this is bottom 2.5%. Uh, so how many do we have in the top 2.5 and the bottom 2.5? There are two ways you can do this. You can subtract 50, I mean 47.5 from 50 and divide it by 2 or you just calculate 2.5% 2 of 50. That will give you the same answer. Okay, so let's do it the first way first. So you have 47.5 for the middle 95%. You take 50 and you subtract it, subtract 47.5 uh, from it, divide that by 2. You're going to have 1.25 in the top 25% and another 1.25 in the bottom 25%. Okay, so that's, uh, these are the numbers that we have. The other way I said you could do it is you just take 50 and multiply by the percentages. Uh, 0 0.025 tells you how many you have in the top 2.5%, 1.25. Okay? So, how do we know if 8 heads is in the middle 95% or not? What this is telling us, this setup is telling us is in order for 8 heads to be in the top 2.5%, from 8 to 10, there has to be um, at most 1.25 heads. Okay? If there is anything more than that, then 8 is not in the uh, top 2.5%, hence it is in the middle 95%. Okay? So let's write that down. If 8 is not in the, where does it say, the middle, 95% as this option uh, claims here, then there must be 1.25 heads from 8 to 10. So let's see, is that the case? Take a look at 8 to 10, or just even start from 9. How many do you have in 9? 9, you have 2 heads. That's way up the top already. Okay? So since um, there are more than 1.25 after 8, that automatically tells you that 8 is in the middle 95% because there is only spots for 1.25 and um, 9 has already claimed all the spot, all the room for the top 2.5%. So if 9 occupies the entire 2.5% and part of the middle 95%, then that automatically tells you that 8 must be in the middle 95%. So this statement that we have right here is false. Okay, the statement is false. The true remark is that 8 is in the middle 
95% because there are more than 1.25 heads above 8, namely 9, which has 2. Okay? So, statement number 2 is false, and that is the correct answer for question number 20. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Really appreciate it. If you found the contents of this tutorial helpful in your preparation for the Regents exam, do give us a thumbs up. Your positive feedback is very valuable to us. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for updates to other tutorials such as this. If you have any questions or comments, just post it in the comment section below and we'll be more than glad to um, support you. More resources can be found on mathgotserve.com. Go ahead and check it out and you can access our playlist by scanning this QR code. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.